Hello and welcome to another Lord It's Lister's podcast. I'm joined by Sam Tokel, a trainee solicitor, and it is as Ali, a solicitor advocate. My name is Owen White, and I'm a trainee solicitor here at Lord It as well. So we've already um, briefly kind of touched on Section 21 notices in a podcast before. Today we're going to touch on Section 8 notices, so basically a completely different notice um, to the one we've discussed before. And I think in a later podcast we might be discussing... Um, Section 21 notices in practice in relation to some cases that we've assisted on. Um, so, Izaz, if you'd like to start us off by um, explaining what a Section 8 notice is. So, a Section 8 notice is used in relation to an assured shorthold tenancy, and we're focusing on England and Wales. Um, and effectively, it's a notice, a legal notice, uh, setting out uh, what we call the reasons for you wanting to evict a tenant. Um, And the reasons are, the technical speak, are effectively grounds for possession. And uh, effectively you would set out what are the reasons that you want a tenant out of your property. Uh, Most common grounds uh, for possession that we come across uh, are in relation to rent arrears. That's by far the biggest um, concern that people have. Uh, and the, the other grounds are, for example, breach of a tenancy agreement or effectively damage to a property or damage to furniture. And with regards to that, you would need to serve a Section 8 notice and set out the grounds for it. And in, in terms of the timings, is it correct that a section 8 notice needs to give you at least either two weeks or two months which is dependent on the ground that the landlord intends to use and that once served um the actual notice period ends within a year uh, that's correct yeah so yeah as i said typically the most common one rent arrears two months notice in relation to that so just to sort of put this into context the section 8 notice is the foundation it's the first step so that's your your notice to the tenant to say, I want possession of this property, i.e. I want the property back from you. I want to end your tenancy. My reasoning for it is set out here. Those are the grounds for possession. And then in addition in addition to that, you would set out the first date, i.e. at the end of that notice period, that you would want that back. Now, in order to come to the table and to be able to serve this notice, In one of the other podcasts we've discussed, uh, and it's very, very important that listeners do uh, listen to that one, and it sets out the prerequisite to serving these notices, what documents need to be in place, i.e. the tenancy agreement, whether you've got a deposit you've taken from the tenant and have you given the tenant the prescribed information, have you registered deposit with one of the government-approved schemes, uh, whether you've served a gas safety certificate in relation to gas supply to the property uh, and you've got a valid certificate at the start of the tenancy. Uh, same thing for the electrical supply um, from the fuse box or consumer unit within the, the property and then the right to rent guide and EPC, energy performance certificate. So those are the sort of documentations you must have in place and then Second reach of that would be the Section 8 notice to serve, to say, here here are the grounds, this is why I want the property back, you'd serve that notice. Um, And importantly, at the end of that notice period, if the tenant hasn't left, you would then need to go to court with the Section 8 notice in hand, and you'd make an application to the court for possession. And then that will set out further the grounds that you've pursued under the Section 8 notice. Um and kind of the rent arrears that you may have with a rent schedule and claiming while you're seeking possession of the property. Correct, yeah. Very, very important to put a, a rent schedule together. So just a, literally a, a simple spreadsheet to show the date, what the amount was due, uh, how what you'd received, if anything, how many days overdue it is. And then if you're claiming interest, also a calculation of the interest and you'd work out what the daily rate is for the rent and the daily rate for the interest. So that from the point of you going to court and, be, and, and hopefully getting possession, the time for the tenant to move out, that be calculated on a daily basis for you to be able to recover that. And will that 
calculation be based on from the time you've served the Section 8 notice or from when the tenant just stopped paying rent? Um, from when the tenant stopped paying rent. But again, on that point, an absolutely crucial point is that sometimes the tenancy agreements that we see um, don't have a provision in there which allows a landlord to recover legal fees in the event that the tenant breaches the tenancy agreement and that they need to you know, take the tenant to court. There's not an automatic provision in there to say that landlord can recover his or her legal fees. And it's really, really, really important, can't stress it enough, for those sort of provisions to be in a well-drafted tenancy agreement because we have on occasion seen cases where uh, the costs of uh, issuing possession proceedings, going through a possession hearing and dealing with witness statements uh, and the likes and the costs have been close to a couple of thousand pounds and yet under the civil procedure rules, the courts only awarded in the region of £440. And it just puts that into context. Now, ordinarily, that's not to say that a court would award, you know, £4,000 of legal costs. That's not the case. But a judge would look at the legal fees and award a fee, or costs, I should say, that the court feels upon summary assessment are reasonable under the circumstances. And we have uh, been to court and had fees in the region of three and a half thousand and quite easily been awarded close to that amount, very close to that amount. So it just shows the amount of work that would go in and what you, you can potentially recover. Whether or not the tenant has the financial means to pay that is an entirely separate matter. But, you know, for the purposes of this discussion, we're talking about an award made by the court. Well, I just want to mention on um, what we said before with regards to um, notice periods. Um, so just in relation to when there's um, antisocial behaviour, uh, there is no minimum notice period for that. And then you can kind of go straight and apply to court for an application. And am I correct in thinking that's the only ground where there is actually no minimum notice period, it could be quite immediately. Whereas, let's say, you know, you've missed on rent or the tenant uh, isn't treating the property correctly. At that point, it may be two weeks or, or two months. The only time that time provision doesn't apply is in relation to antisocial behaviour. Yeah, that's completely correct. An application for that where virtually no notice is being provided, you're, you're effectively giving the tenant either sort of seven days notice, I, I, I should imagine. What you need to do and what we always advise landlords to do is do your homework. If there is antisocial behaviour, there'll be neighbouring uh, tenants in neighbouring properties or tenants in the same building. There'll be the environment health officer. There'll be the police reports. You need to get all of that information together so that when you make an application to the court, you can bolster your application with a witness statement in support, which you, you you will need. And that statement will have all of the other information exhibited to it so that when a deputy district judge or district judge looks at this at a county court, they've got your statement with all of this additional information at hand for them to be able to make an informed decision and hopefully a favorable decision for you. Great. Um, I think that kind of covers Section 8 notices. Um, is there anything either of you would like to add? Um, yeah, just in relation to the notices in general, um, is there's circumstances in which it might be uh, rendered invalid, uh, which we've covered in our previous Section 21 notice. Um, so that's just in relation to serving the documents itself and any mistakes or any kind of documents that you haven't um, got ready or served on the tenant before you kind of serve the Section 8 notice. So um, if you want to listen to that, please listen to our other podcasts in more depth. Okay, thank you, everybody.